Spirit might give illumination and that you might open the text to our understanding and we commit this into your hands. Help us Lord to understand your word. We do pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I gave out a handout um, to front and back. On the front side there is an outline of kind of a road map to what we'll be talking about tonight. And on the back side is a selected bibliography for presuppositional apologetics. Now if you notice on the front side, uh, on the outline, I've identified principles or tenets of presuppositional apologetics, which, are, which will come out of the text as we go through these texts. I think in the, in the uh, email you sent out, we had cited Romans 1 verses 18 through 25 as our text, but I thought that would be uh, a little bit uh, too advanced to jump right into it at this point. So what, what I want to try to do is go through three texts of Scripture and simply a answer the question or attempt to answer the question, what is apologetics? What is defending the faith from the biblical perspective? So. Uh, with that as an introduction, um, let me just say, I, I am a Ph.D. scientist. I've been a research scientist for over 30 years in the field of DNA. Uh, I've talked to a lot of scientists. I've talked to a number of Nobel laureates. I understand their mindset and how they think. And um, from my early days, I've had to change my view to a more biblical approach to apologetics. So... That's what I want to uh, present to you today as an, uh, an introduction. There are really um, only two approaches to apologetics. There is evidential apologetics and presuppositional apologetics. I am unashamedly a presuppositionalist. And by that I simply mean that I hold the Word of God to be absolute and ultimate in authority. And this is a presupposition that I hold to by faith, and I don't think you can be a Christian without holding to this by faith, that the Bible is the Word of God. Now, you see the difference in evidential apologetics and presuppositional apologetics is um, essentially the place you give to Scripture. In evidential apologetics, one begins outside of Scripture with evidences, and reasons to Scripture. They reason from uh, facts or scientific evidences and so forth, archaeological uh, finds and uh, historical data, and they reason to Scripture, and it's an attempt to validate Scripture. And so Scripture then becomes an, a hypothesis to be proven by evidences, and it's never embraced as actual truth. Uh, it must be subjected to man's autonomous reasoning, and he reasons independently from God. And at best, Scripture, if he follows the worldly empiricism, will only be a probability in the end, for science does not admit to any absolutes. So this exalts human reasoning and makes man as ultimate uh, in, as judge over God's word. And so God becomes, God's in the dock, so to speak. God becomes on trial, and man sits in judgment over God and his word. But this is, um, from the very get-go, uh, a fut futile way of arguing the faith, because man is not neutral. Unbelieving thought is not neutral, and we'll get into this as this lecture goes on. But to argue strictly from evidences without the presupposition of Scripture is to betray the lordship of Jesus and the authority of his word. So, 
As in your outline, the first tenet of presuppositional apologetics that I want you to consider is that God and His Word are presupposed to be absolute and ultimate. They are preconditions of knowledge. We don't prove that the Bible is true. Just when the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, God never proves Himself to exist. It's, it's presupposed. The scripture never proves God. It's a presupposition. It's a precondition for knowledge. And so this is the first and overshadowing presupposition to a truly biblical approach to apologetics. And there's no higher authority for man in knowledge, reasoning, or in his understanding. Is that this, God is absolute, and therefore his revelation to us is absolute. It is the inspired, infallible, inerrant, all-sufficient word of God. Why is it Absolute, because God is its author. Why is it inerrant? Because God is its author. Why is it infallible? Because God is its author. This, this must be the presupposition of all Christians. And in today's evidential approach, it's very deceptive, because it's, this is not the presupposition of evidential apologetics. So I want to begin with two anecdotes. One from Professor Oliphant uh, at Westminster Theological Seminary. He's the professor of apologetics there. And one of his students went to a conference on defending the faith. And the keynote speaker began with this statement. This year our topic is apologetics. So you really don't need your Bibles with you. And that is where evidential apologetics leads to. Because if you begin with the evidences, if you begin with the facts, and have to prove Scripture, you're putting man in judgment of God, who is absolute. Something is flipped completely around at that point. I must admit, in my early days, I read all the books I could on the fossils and so forth, and my arguments to defend the faith was from the evidences. And I quickly learned that it was not a battle of it was not dependent upon God it was a battle of the wits and the one who knew the more facts the one who was better read was the one who won the argument so you'd win some and you'd lose some but there was no dependence upon the Holy Spirit to change the heart of man to open the eyes of the scientist Back in the 80s, my second anecdote was back in the 80s. Uh, as a research scientist, I kept up with the journals. And the two most prestigious journals were Science and Nature. And so if there's any breakthrough in science, any new technology, it was first published, the breakthrough paper was published in either Science or Nature. And so I'd like to catch up on all the, all the new research, and I'd also like to read the editorials. And I came across this one editorial, and it was a critique of the Creation Research Institute, which at the time was in San Diego. And it was this short editorial letter, less than a column in length on the page. And the gist of the editorial was this. Why does the Creation Research Institute act like deists when they profess to be theists? And that, that struck me like a, like a brick in my face. This guy was exactly right. Here's this unbeliever critiquing the Christian's worldview. And he says, you've thrown out the Bible. You're acting like deists. And it was a, he, he pointed out this gross contradiction in the method of apologetics. So he, he said that they ha have abandoned the very foundation of their faith. And I knew at this point that something was really wrong with my approach to apologetics. See, to the deist, Scripture has no authority, for he does not believe in the special revelation of God. A deist believes in the existence of God purely on rationalistic grounds, without any reference to the authority of God's re revelation. 
to the deist, man's reasoning is held up as ultimate. And he begins to autonomously interpret the facts of nature without any reference to God. And he would not dare to use scripture as an authority to interpret any fact or evidence. And this opened my eyes. The inconsistency of reasoning from the evidences. A theist, on the other hand, believes in God, and that's based upon the authority of God's self-attesting word. That's the very definition of what we are as Christians. We believe God has revealed himself to us through his word, and it's an absolute revelation to us. And so I ask myself this question, am I a deist or am I a Christian? And if I'm a Christian, why am I, why am I acting like a deist? So I hope that gives you a little bit of an introduction of some of my journey through this. Coming, coming to see presuppositional apologetics as the only truly uh, biblical approach. So I want to start, I don't want to assume anything I just want to start with three texts of Scripture, and as I said in the beginning, and answer this question, what is apologetics? And in the process of doing this, we'll, we'll gather up some of the principles of presuppositional apologetics as they come up in our um, exposition of these texts. And as we work through these three texts, hopefully we'll have an idea of what the Bible tells us about defending the faith. So the first text is, of course, the, the charter text for apologetics in the Bible, and that is 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I just want to break this into three parts the call to apologetics, the method, and the spirit. First, the call. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh. Let me just say this. This is a call to every Christian to be ready to engage in apologetics, to be ready to give it in a defense of the hope that is in you. Every believer is to be prepared, not just the professional. Not just the scientist, not just the theologian or the philosopher. This is to every Christian. The Lord is asking us here to be prepared. This word, always ready, or ready always, um, means to be perpetually prepared. At any time, and at every time, we're to be prepared. In the providence of God, and in the acquaintances God brings across our path. We never know when we're going to be called upon to give an answer to our faith. And we're to be evangelistic in that sense, to be prepared. And so we must learn apologetics for our own spiritual well-being and for our Christian maturity. Now this Greek word to give an answer, this Greek word for answer, is apologia. And this is where we get our English word apologetics from. Now this term apologia is a technical term meaning to speak in defense of oneself. It was used in the ancient world for the defense of a, a, an accused person offered in a court of law. And what we mean theologically by apologetics is the defense of the faith. Now apologia is a compound word made from a preposition apo, from, and logion meaning utterance or speech, is a form of logos. Thus it means to speak from a certain position, to speak from a reasoned position. Further, the Apostle says, be, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. This word for reason here is from logos again, but in the context it means uh, logic, not, not the formal symbolic logic of philosophy, but it means a rationale. Be able to give a reasoned, 
rational defense of what you believe. And this is incumbent upon all believers. Now the method. And here is where I think people go astray at. They do not quite understand the imperative that Paul's giving us here. In the King James it reads, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That is a commandment. It's an imperative. And the correct tense, or text, is sanctify the Lord Christ in your heart. Our duty in the work of apologetics is to sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts. Now the verb sanctify, hagiazo, as we get hagias, the word for hagiasmas, the word for a holiness. And it means to set apart. Set apart in your hearts, that is the center of our reasoning, the center of our thinking and understanding, set apart the Lord, Jesus Christ. When we go about the work of defending the faith, first and foremost, Christ must be honored as Lord. And our method can never waver from this. There's a, uh, in the grammar of the original language, it is an aorist imperative. So, the sense is, with determination, set apart Christ as Lord in your heart. And then Lord is placed forward in the original language to give it emphasis. So it's Lord Christ set apart in your heart. It's, it's, it's a very uh, emphatic statement in the original language. We are to bow to the Lordship of Christ in every area of life, which includes scholarship, academics, and for our subject tonight, in particular, apologetics. This is our starting point. Christ and His Word. Christ is Lord, and His Word to us is absolute. And the Christian is obligated to, to presuppose the Word of Christ in every area of knowledge. For God demands, in the work of apologetics, an unreserved allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if we were to presuppose the Word of God is absolute, and Christ is Lord, it may be objected at this point that you're coming to the unbeliever with a biased point of view. Where's your common ground? Where's your point of contact? You have nothing in common to begin with. When you can't be neutral and objective about something, you come already biased, aren't you destroying any common ground and point of contact? That's, that's the objection. Well, the answer to that is neutrality is a myth. It's a delusion to think that man is neutral in his interpretation of the evidence. We all have our presuppositions. We all have our belief system. Now, many have never thought about this, but everyone has a belief system they have, which is made up of their presuppositions about reality, especially in science, and their naturalistic philosophy, which they interpret the data from. So the unbeliever, he has his presuppositions, and he has his worldview, and it's antithetical to the Christian's. And he would have the Christian under the guise of neutrality, under the guise of being ob objective, to give up that for a second and to come on my turf and reason from my worldview. To do that is to give up the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Unbelieving thought, in the first place, is under the power of the noetic effects of sin. The fall of man had a drastic effect on man's reasoning capacity and his ability to understand reality. The term noetic is from nous, the Greek word nous, mind. That when man fell and became uh, a sinner and the human race was cursed and under total depravity, Man's mind did not come out unscathed. 
man's reasoning capacity, his intellectual faculty, became hostile to God. And he was born with a false theory of knowledge from that point on. Where he, we're told in Romans 1.25, where he will seek to exchange the truth of God for a lie. He lives in a world of self-deception. His thoughts, we're told in Genesis 6.5, are overcome by moral corruption. He's futile in his reasoning, we're told in Romans 1.21. And one very revealing uh, aspect of Romans 1, 18 is that he suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. It's a deliberate and positive suppression of the truth that he sees about God. In the sense of deity being created in God's image that he has to suppress. And he deliberately holds it down. The effects of sin here refer to the doctrine of total depravity, the noetic effects of sin. The Bible characterizes the unbeliever's mindset as depraved, his understanding darkened, Ephesians 4.18, groping around in darkness, Acts 17.27, walking in the vanity of his mind, Ephesians 4.17, hostile to God in his mind, Romans 8.7, an enemy of God in his mind. This characterizes unbelievers' thought process, unbelievers' mindset. In short, man's ability to reason has been totally depraved through the fall. He's become destitute, destitute of true knowledge because of his hatred for God. He's noetically blind, and since he can't perceive the Creator in true reality, he's spiritually insane. <coughs> and constantly suppressing this truth. You see, in this reality of original sin, and its consequent noetic effects on the mind, correlates directly to the unbeliever's ability to truly know anything. And consequently, one's apologetic method must take into account the noetic effects of sin. That man is incapable of objectively reasoning, He's incapable of being neutral. And more than that, he's positively in hatred against God. He cannot be neutral. Yet the unbeliever claims that we must be, he must have intellectual autonomy in order to interpret the universe. This fallacious epistemology, this... Um, theory of knowledge that the unbeliever has without any reference to God as his creator. He is a deliberate and hostile act against God. He will determine for himself what is false and what is true. And sinful man naturally will make himself ultimate in doing this as we're told in 2 Corinthians 10, that he will exalt himself against the knowledge of God. This is why apologetics must be approached at the presuppositional level. You must go to the belief system of the unbeliever. And it's basically this. The unbeliever believes himself to be autonomous and independent of God, and therefore he has the right to think independently of God, to define things differently than what God has defined. And he believes that his reasoning capacity is ultimate. And he won't have the authority of Scripture interfere with that. It should be obvious, in light of this, that there is no neutrality. There is no neutral interpretation of the evidences. For all facts are created facts. God defined his creation. He decreed all things. And he has given meaning to all things. And for us to think his thoughts after him and give the same meaning as he's given and give the same definition as he's given to this universe 
That is to have true knowledge. This the unbeliever will not do. And he is dead set against it. See, so we cannot begin with some neutral ground outside of Scripture and then reason to Scripture as if we're letting man validate it. That's to deny the absolute authority of God's Word. It would be to give up the very foundation of our faith, the absolute standard of our faith, the Word of God. And he would force the Christian to use his apostate theory of knowledge, to use his, I've dealt a lot with natural theology and I've dealt a lot with um, naturalism. Which, of course, if you know anything about that, God cannot come into this closed system. God cannot get in. And they have to deify other things. And, of course, there is no such thing as a miracle. So, so if a person has the belief system that there is no such thing as a miracle, and you try to prove to him, let's say, the resurrection of Christ, in his very belief system, there cannot be a miracle. So when you say you present historical facts to him, and he can't answer you, what, what's his mindset? His mindset is, this is kind of uh, an anomaly in, uh, that, that is very strange. But given, if he's honest about it, but given enough time and as technology advances, we'll understand it better and we'll be able to explain it by natural phenomena. This is the way they think. But we don't have the right to set apart God's word in any of our thinking. We're to set apart the Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts. And the third place this verse deals with Well, the spirit in which we are to conduct ourselves in the defense of the faith. He says in at the end of uh, verse 15, with meekness and fear. We're not to be parading our knowledge. We're not to be arrogant or rude or disrespectful. We're not to be contentious. We're representing Christ in the gospel when we defend the faith. A text that I was asked to preach at my ordination was 2 Timothy 2.24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men, apt to teach, patience, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if peradventure God will give them repentance to acknowledging of the truth. The Christian is to be adorned with humility. And in all three of our texts, this theme will come out again and again and again. Well, let's go uh, to our next text. 2 Corinthians 10, 1 through 5. Well, let's, let's, let's go 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Paul is describing here a conflict between the world's wisdom and the wisdom of God. And he's using this military metaphor to illustrate this. He describes this conflict in terms of a spiritual warfare that's not against people, but against their thought patterns, their philosophies, and their human reasoning. You see, philosophers and men of science are constantly advancing their opinions against the knowledge of God. And human reasoning is constantly seeking to exalt itself higher than the knowledge of God. And so Paul uses this military metaphor, and I want to break it down into four aspects. Rules of engagement, weapons, military strategy, and prisoners of war. So indeed, uh, apologetics is a spiritual warfare. 
The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 6 that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And we find here first the rules of engagement. In verse 1, we're told, Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Here again, the rule for conducting this military campaign of apologetics is the meekness and gentleness of Christ. And Paul would have us imitate the behavior of our Lord. And that was the very character of Christ. Meekness and gentleness. Now that doesn't mean the other person is going to follow those same rules of engagement. That doesn't mean they're not going to be nasty towards you. But it doesn't matter. You're, you're representing Christ and the Lord. And you have to uh, maintain your humility during it all. They may, may be belligerent. They may call you names. They may get nasty about it. I've had some people get very upset at me. And you'll be tried. Your faith will be tried to maintain this meekness and gentleness of spirit. Now the weapons in the second place of this battle are given in verse 3 and 4 to consider. He says, We do not war after the flesh, for our weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Are not carnal. That means we're not depending upon our ability to reason. We're not depending upon our power of argument, or enticing words of man's wisdom. You might think this guy is brilliant. He's way over my head. I have no way of getting through to this brilliant scientist or whatever. Yes, you do. Because your weapons are not carnal. You trust in the Lord to open the minds and to present Christ as Lord. Paul did not rely upon the worldly philosophies of empiricism, naturalism, the scientific method. His weapons, which he says are mighty, was the power of God. He had confidence that if there's any success in this warfare, it's going to be through the power of God. And Paul would pull down these strongholds, these fortresses of unbelieving thought by divine power. <coughs> Apologetics is an act of faith. If that is so, apologetics is an act of faith. It cannot be, uh, it should not be attempted without prayer. It should be prayerfully uh, sought. And it's an act of faith in trusting God to open the eyes and change the heart. It is God that grants faith. It is God that gives the grace to believe in Christ and hold the word of God as ultimate in authority. It is God that regenerates and converts the heart. That was Paul's strength. That was his confidence. He trusted in God. Third, let's consider the military strategy here. It, was, it is an offensive strategy that alludes to different stages of a military campaign in what is known as ancient siege uh, warfare, where they sieged a city in ancient times. And he says, For our weapons of warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds, fortresses, tearing them down. Imagine a city, and the cities were all uh, encompassed in the perimeter with a, uh, with a wall. And then there was fortresses and towers uh, for lookout to defend the city. And Paul says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. <coughs> Three things here are mentioned. <coughs> Excuse me. Destroying defensive uh, fortifications, taking captives, and punishing the resistance. Paul identifies the enemy's strongholds as imaginations and every high thing that opposes the knowledge of God. What is this word imagination? 
In the in the Greek, it's la logizomus, which means reasonings, reasonings, logical arguments. There is no definite article. It's not any specific kind of reasoning. It's all such human arguments that put themselves against God and seek to exalt themselves against God. It's all the world's thought patterns, their opinions, their philosophies, a very general term. And this fortress, Paul says, must be torn down. It's a battle against belief systems. It's a battle against world views. And the Christian here is called to pull them down. Further, every high, thi every high thing here alludes to a high tower. <coughs> it is, Paul is saying here, unregenerate man sets up these high towers of his reasoning, and he thinks that they're impenetrable. And Paul says, but by the power of God they're to be pulled down. Satan's stronghold in the hearts of men, carnal reasoning, and high thoughts against the, the knowledge of God. Paul wants us to demolish these things. The fortresses of worldly reason. The very belief systems of man. Their thought processes, their mindset. And so, as we look at another principle of presuppositional apologetics from this, is that apologetics is a collision of world views. We have to argue our world view against their world view. And their world view is going to exalt man against God, exalt man's reasoning as ultimate, and, it's going to, and they're going to claim to be independent and autonomous. With a Christian holds to the absolute authority of the Word of God. And those two worldviews are in conflict with each other. And we're to show that the unbeliever cannot make sense of anything in reality without borrowing from our worldview. I was at a, uh, a with my former company, I was at a research uh, retreat. We, were, we got some of the top scientists from the company from the country, and we were brainstorming. And the first evening, they put the ten scientists at a round table. And I, I sat at that table. And some of these very uh, high-named, well-published scientists began to speak about evolution. And some of my colleagues knew that uh, my position on evolution, and they allowed this to go on. And uh, they talked about evolution as a matter of fact. Um, and, and they just went into it. And so I waited for the opportune time because I knew what I was going to say. I was going to challenge the world view. I knew that they did not believe in absolute truth. And so when the opportune time came, I said, let me ask you a question. What one thing do you know to be absolutely true about evolution? And they were dumbfounded. Not one of them could answer. And they looked at me. They were startled. And then finally this German scientist says, well, we don't know it to be absolutely true, but we know it to be very probable. <laughs> also, you're admitting that you're uncertain about it then. You're admitting that you don't know anything, absolutely. And yet you talk about evolution that it's absolutely true. And then we had to talk about probability and chance. And in their world of thinking, chance reigns supreme. Chance and randomness. And their whole structure of evolution is built upon chance and randomness. And then I, and then I said, you know, since I challenged them that they don't know anything for sure, they had to come back with probabilities. And it was an argument of probability and chance. And I said, well, this is very interesting. You can't make sense out of chance without order in nature. You have to come over to my, my worldview of God creating order and giving you the laws of nature and giving you consistent created laws of nature for you to make sense out of chance. You have to borrow from me to make sense out of every, everything. 
And they were getting a little miffed at this point. And the marketing department and people started coming around the table and we became like the entertainment for the evening. <laughs> and, uh, and to make a long story short, the president of the company came behind me. He saw me. It was me against the whole room. And he put his hands on my shoulder. We were pretty good friends. And he says, you have to understand Paul. He's very religious. He kind of came in at the end of the discussion. And I looked over my shoulder and I said, I'm not the one having a problem here, Ken. <laughs> but those were one, some great times uh, I had. Uh, you know, the, the Lord doesn't give you too many of those times. But those, that was a, a very memorable experience. But it is a collision of world views. And you have to go to the very heart of, of what they believe. And show them how inconsistent it is. And how they can't make sense out of anything. Unless they borrow from the Christian's world view. Unless, unless they borrow from my view that presupposes a creator as given in the word of God. Who created all things. Who created and gave order to this world and universe. Unless they, they use that. They cannot make sense out of everything, anything. They have to borrow it from me. It's a great contradiction for science to say everything is randomness and chance, and on the other hand say, well, we really can't make sense of it without the laws of nature and the order given to creation. Well, finally, I'll just say this, that the fourth aspect here that Paul deals with is prisoners of war. And he says that every thought is to be made captive to the obedience of Christ. And this refers to prisoners of war. Those people he is arguing with, right? Paul does just not want to destroy the opponent's argument. He's going to make them prisoners of war. He wants their thoughts, their reasoning, their worldview to be brought into submission to Christ. Their mindset must be transformed and renewed. This implies, for this to happen, that God must save this person. God must open their eyes. God must regenerate this person. And here's the goal of apologetics. It's the conversion of sinners. And in that sense, it's very much like evangelism. And finally, the last text, how much time do I have? you got about 18 minutes. Okay, we can do this. The last text is Jude 3. <clears throat> Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Jude 3 here is a very important text for apologetics because it identifies what the Christian is to defend. Before we consider how to defend the faith, we have to know what we're defending. Are we defending some isolated facts of science, some isolated evidences? What are we defending? And Jude gives a clear description of the faith every Christian is to defend. First, he says, to earnestly contend for the faith. And this uh, kind of asserts his purpose for writing the letter, that they would earnestly contend for the faith. <coughs> now the Greek word for contend is ep agonizomai. Ep, uh, being an intensifying uh, preposition, but it's from agonizomai. That's where we get the Greek word agony. To agonize. So this defense of the faith and earnestly contending for it is something that's, that's going to be rigorous. It's something that is, is likened unto, here this word is used for, for either uh, an athletic contest like a wrestler or it's used for a military battle. It's a, again a, mili a, a metaphor. I think here in the context, is he's speaking about a, res a wrestler. To agonize and contend for the faith. It's a rigorous fight and an intense struggle. It reminds me of our missionary 
Tom Montgomery who, who said that every conversion is a knockdown, drag out fight, sometimes taking years. When Jude here exhorts his readers to earnestly contend for the faith, he is referring not to a Christian's personal faith in Christ, but rather to the content of faith. In the Greek, when faith possesses a definite article like the, the, the faith, it, it becomes objective. It's not a subjective faith. He's speaking about the content of faith, a definite body of truth that was articulated at the time of the apostles. Now, we find uh, various terms for this in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul refers to the faith as, rec as a recognized system of doctrine numerous times. And I have you know, a list of ten texts of Scripture here. Other New Testament terms describe this body of truth as the doctrine, the sound doctrine, the doctrine of Christ, the apostles' doctrine, that form of doctrine, that pattern of doctrine, the deposit of truth. And these terms all indicate that at the time of the apostles, the New Testament authors and the New Testament authors, there was a clearly defined authoritative system of Christian doctrine derived from Scripture that was the true expression of the Christian faith. And this is what Jude is calling upon Christians to earnestly contend for. Further, Jude describes the faith here as the once delivered unto the saints. Now in the original language you have the faith, right? But in the middle as like an adjective, it is the once delivered unto the saints' faith. It's all one string. The once revealed, revealed once and for all. God's revelation is complete in Christ. God who, we're told in Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. You see, the faith that we are defending is based upon the completed work of Christ. And this inspired writing, this revelation is complete, never to be altered, to be supplemented, to be subtracted to or added from. To do so would be to deny the inspiration, the authority, and the all-sufficiency of Scripture. Any new doctrine inconsistent with the system of truth as given to us in the Word of God is a falsehood and should invoke all Christians to earnestly contend for the faith. We're told also that this system of truth that was, was handed down to us by God Himself this was not the concoction of the apostles. It was not made up by anybody. It was handed down to us by God himself. And so when defending us, defending it, we defend it with the authority of God. God has credentialed it as his system and body of truth. And then third, as in all of our text, this objective system was entrusted to all Christians. Jude uses the term the saints, the ones delivered unto the saints, plural. And that's a term that denotes Christians. Defending the faith, again, is not for professionals and biblical scholars. It is for every Christian. It's the duty of every Christian. So let me just finish with the, the last tenet and the corollary. From this text, Jude 3, we learn that Christianity is to be defended as a coherent whole. The once delivered unto the saints' faith. A coherent whole. We must defend this system of truth contained in Scripture as a unit. Scripture alone determines the content of faith. And the business of apologetics is to set forth 
this coherent truth as presented in the scripture. This unity of doctrine that the scripture gives to us is the expression of a Christian's worldview. And thus we, we arrive then at a definition. A definition of apologetics is the vindication of Christian theism. We're defending a coherent whole. We're defending the Bible. We're, uh, we're defending not only asserting the absolute authority of the Bible, but all that it contains, the body of truth there. A coherent whole. And then just maybe to look at a corollary. If we're defending Christianity as a coherent whole, then it seems to be useless to defend isolated facts and reason from isolated facts to Scripture. And so often I use the, the, uh, the example of the resurrection, how we'll take historic facts and neglect the fact that the unbeliever has their own worldview and principles of interpretation. You see, facts are not the issue. We all have the same facts. The issue is the interpretation of facts. And to interpret facts, you have to have a preconditioned worldview. You have presuppositions by which you interpret the facts. So it becomes an issue of interpretation. And to take isolated facts and reason to Scripture is useless. Nobody interprets facts in a neutral fashion. We've already discussed that. They have their own belief systems, just like we have ours. And of course, we've already dealt with the noetic effects of sin. <coughs> facts are not brute. That means facts don't come with a, come they, as if they don't have purpose, or as if they're unrelated to anything. If everything was randomness and chance, as science would have you to believe, then no fact is related to itself. And their system falls apart. It's incoherent at that point. Because of the whole point of science, scientific law is that it is constant. And yet they say it's all random and chance. Because they must, they must hold that facts are brute facts. Because to say otherwise is to presuppose purpose and a creator. And that they will not do. It's the triune God of Scripture that has pre-interpreted and foreordained all facts. He gave them their meaning. He defined what they were. And it's futile to defend facts apart from Scripture. Because the Scripture gives us the only true definition and meaning of facts. Mm -hmm. So we're not defending isolated facts such as the resurrection or the virgin birth of Christ. We're defending Christianity as a coherent whole. And we should be showing that rationality is only possible from a Christian's worldview. Everything is reduced to irrationality without the Christian's worldview. And that's presuppositionalism in a nutshell. In a nutshell, you step over to the unbeliever's worldview and you critique it. You say, this is, this and this is what's wrong with your worldview. Come over to mine. You can't understand anything. You can't give any true meaning. You have no true knowledge without my worldview. Your worldview is irrational. Mine is, mine is the only coherent worldview. And it's based upon the absolute authority of the Word of God. That's presuppositional. We'll close right there. Um, I'll close in prayer. Yeah, cool. Lord, we pray uh, that these words uh, be according to your Word. Pray that you would uh, help us to consider it and to look at the text of Scripture, that we be biblical in everything that we do. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.